You're traveling through another dimension. A dimension not only of sight and sound, but of mind. A journey into a wondrous land whose boundaries are those of imagination. Your next stop, the Twilight Zone. One old-fashioned, one scotch rocks, a whiskey sour, and a B&B. Which table? Number three. Miller, Jackson, and Whitaker, right? That's right. The usual. Got it. Oh, and make the scotch a double. For Mr. Jackson. You're learning. Oh, man, Jackson. Bet he was here before I was born. As was I. <clears throat> uh, no offense, William. None taken. Who's the whiskey sour for? Mr. Corrigan has joined them again this evening. I wonder why. I expect he wants to learn from the past. Yeah, but that's all those old guys talk about. The past. He ought to join another club. Some place that's co-ed, at least. There's no substitute for experience, Daniel. None whatsoever. If you want to learn the ropes, so to speak. I hear that. Here you go. Shall I run a tab? Table three always runs a tab. Gotcha. Bring me another bourbon, will you please, William? Certainly, sir. Oh, and some peanuts to go with that. Yes, sir. Well, <laughs> that trumps me. No more cards, gentlemen. You've picked my pockets again. <laughs> we play by the honor system, Corrigan. You know you have a line of credit with us? No, not tonight. Unless you care to let me make that last bid over again. You don't think that would change anything, do you, Peter? We had you on the ropes ten minutes ago. Yes, but if I bid spades instead of hearts... Wouldn't have made a bit of difference. Trust me, boy. I do trust you, Mr. Jackson. It was my error. No doubt about that. You have a point, though. One small detail, a jog to the left instead of the right, say, and things might turn out quite differently. So true. Just put the drinks down over there, would you, William? Of course. So you're saying? He's saying that life turns on the finest of points, and I must say I agree. <laughs> In a game of cards, yes, but... Uh... Will there be anything else? Not just now, William. Very good, sir. What exactly are you getting at? Oh, we've all seen it time and again. One vote more or less on the floor, a scandal that might have been avoided, and our current political standings would be quite different. It's a matter of choices as well as luck. Let's say, Corrigan, that you go back in time. Yes, yes, and if that were possible, there'd be nothing to stop me from altering the course of history. Is that it? Imagine this. It's October 1929, the day before the stock market crashed. If only my grandfather had known about that one. You know that on the following morning, the securities are going to tumble into an abyss. And how would I know? Because you carry with you the knowledge of the present, of what's to come. Of course. Of course. Now, using that prior knowledge, there are a hundred things you can do to protect yourself. But following your logic, I'd be anachronism. They'd spot me right away, probably lock me up, because I don't really belong back there. My clothes, my speech. It doesn't matter. You'd find a way to pass. The important thing is, once you were there, you could sell your holdings the day before the crash. As my grandfather should have. All right, but what if I did? And that very act started the crash a day earlier. He does have a point. Though even that's unlikely. How uh, so? Hear me out. History tells us that on October 24th, 1929, the bottom dropped out of the stock market. That's a fixed date. October 24th, 1929. It already exists as an event in the history of the 20th century, in our own past. The forces that made us as we are. Ergo, by definition, it can't be altered. Not by those of us who are products of those very events. You see? And I say it can. What's to prevent it? What would be the mechanism to make it occur? A time machine? Uh, some technology that hasn't been invented yet? What's the mechanism for human life, birth and death? Do we understand that? No. But it's real, I assure you. Jackson's right. What's to prevent me, say, from going to a broker on the morning of October 23rd or October 22nd? Why go back that far? Yesterday would do nicely. Go to the racetrack with a list of winning horses. That would be entirely for personal gain. A matter of manipulating numbers. When you're dealing with matters of life and death... Why else go back to 1929, then? Unless... 
You can think of a reason other than money. <laughs> well, there was a certain little flapper named Louise Brooks. Well, that was before even your time, Walter. <laughs> Alas. <laughs> Witness a theoretical argument at the very private Potomac Club in Washington, D.C. The club was founded in 1858, but the argument is occurring in the present between four intelligent men. They're talking about an improbable thing, whether it's possible to go back in time. A friendly debate after a game of cards revolving around a simple issue. Could a human being actually change what has happened before? Interesting and theoretical, because who ever heard of a man going back in time? Until tonight, that is. Because the Potomac Club just happens to be situated not only in Washington, D.C., but somewhere near the edges of the Twilight Zone. And now, back to our story from the Twilight Zone. Back There, starring Jim Caviezel, with Stacy Keach as your narrator. There can be no such device according to science. Don't be so sure. The answer may lie within rather than from a deus ex machina. Ever hear of black ops? I've heard of men in black. Same thing. There's secret funding going on right now, strictly off the books, you understand, to project the minds of CIA agents to other locations. Now, if they can do that using only brain waves, Who says they can do that? Gentlemen, gentlemen, we've strayed from the subject. The topic is the paradox of time travel. Oh, we don't even know if it exists. Care to place a friendly wager on that? Thousands of people disappear every year into thin air. Poof. Who can say where they go? Maybe they found another place to go. Some place where they're needed. Uh, what? Some place where their talents are useful. You're all right, my boy. Yeah, yes. Uh, I just felt a bit... Dizzy there. It happens to me too. Not enough sleep. I say where they can make a genuine contribution. I fear that some of us were born too early or too late. My feelings as well. A man named Charles Fort once said. W what time is it getting to be? Mm, coming up on seven o'clock, I should think. What does your watch say? Closer to eight, actually. Gentlemen, uh, I'm afraid I'll have to leave the subject of time travel to you and H.G. Wells. I'm much too tired to get any more metaphysical than that. And since nobody has ever gone back in time... Care to place a friendly wager? Then the whole blame thing is much too theoretical, as far as I'm concerned. See you over the weekend? If you don't get lost back there, Peter. Where? Why, in time, of course. I'll try not to. Good evening, everybody. Leaving, Mr. Corrigan. That's right, William. Good night. Oh, I'm desperately sorry, sir. I've spilled coffee on your sleeve. Um, uh, no harm, William. No harm at all. Oh, that was clumsy of me. I think I shall survive. I really do. Uh, let me wipe your jacket. No need, honestly. I'll see you tomorrow. Uh, did you have a coat with you, sir? No, I'm rushing the season a little tonight, William. I felt spring in the air. Came out like this. Well, April is spring, sir. It's getting there. What is the date? April 14th, Mr. Corrigan. April 14th already? And the year? I beg your pardon, sir. I'm just kidding, William. I know what year it is. Of course, sir. Well, good night, William. Take care of yourself. I'll do my best, sir. Taxi, mister? No, uh, thanks. Uh, I think I'll just walk. Okay, Mac. What is wrong with me? My head? Who is it? What do you want? I need to sit down for a moment. I don't feel well. And you are? Peter Corrigan, a guest of Mr. Jackson. Mr. Jackson? I was just inside. No, you were not. Of course I was. We are closed this evening. This is the Potomac Club, isn't it? It is. Then let me in. I left something inside. 
Now see here, you. The club is closed. But I just left here a minute ago. The devil you did. Are you drunk, young man? Is that it? I am not drunk. I want to see Mr. Jackson. There is no Mr. Jackson here. Or Whitaker, or Millard, or William. Let me talk to William. Where is he? William who? I don't know his last name. William, what, what's the matter with you? Where did you come from? And what's the idea of those clothes you're wearing? As good as your clothes, sir. Now be gone with you. Hey, come on, open up. You best get away from here. I'll call the police. Go on, get out of here. Carriage, sir. Carriage? Since when are there carriages in Washington? Why, since always, sir. May I take you somewhere? Get away from me. I'll go home. That's it. And sleep it off. I'll go home. All right, all right. Have a bit of patience. I'm coming. Yes? Sorry, my key didn't work. Your key? Oh, no. <clears throat> Who are you, may I ask? Mrs. Landers, the landlady. You're the landlady? And you, sir? Is this 19 West 12th Street? That's right. Whom did you wish to see? To see? Which one of our guests, young man? I used to live here. It's the oldest building in the section of town. I was just wondering if... How's that? What I mean is, as I remember it, it was the oldest... Well, now, really, I can't spend the whole evening standing here talking about silly things like which is the oldest building. If there's nothing else... Then do you have a room? Uh, I have, for acceptable boarders. Do you come from around here? Yes. Uh, yes, I, I do. Army veteran? Yes. Uh, as a matter of fact, I am. Well, come in. I'll show you what I have. Your coat. What? Your long coat and your hat. You may leave them by the door. Of course. I'm... <laughs> I'm not used to it. Used to what? The hat. I don't wear a hat very often. May I inquire as to your business? I'm an engineer. Really? A professional man? Hmm. Well, come upstairs and I'll show you the room. Not the one on the second floor, by any chance, at the end of the hall? Why, yes. How would you know that? Well, I've heard good reports about your establishment. I'm planning to repaint it soon. Oh, don't do that. I beg your pardon? Well, I mean I'd like to see it in its original colors, before it was remodeled, before it is remodeled. Well, I suppose it will do for a while longer. I'm sure it's fine. Off to the play? That's right, Mrs. Landers. Dinner at the Willard and then to the play if my husband finds a cab in time. Well, enjoy yourselves and applaud the president for me. We'll certainly do that. Good night, Mrs. Landers. Good night, my dear. Have a good time. This way, Mr. Corrigan. What did you say? What did I say? To whom? When? To the gentleman in uniform. What did you just say to him? Now what's the trouble? You just said something to him about the president. She told me to applaud him. Where might your sympathies lie? Yes, young man. Which army were you in? The Army of the Republic, of course. Uh, then why make such an issue of applauding President Lincoln? That's his due, is it not? That and everything else. May the good Lord bless him. You're going to the play tonight? We hope to, if my husband stops dawdling. What theater? What play? Ford's Theater, of course. Ford's Theater. Ford's Theater. Are you all right? I mean, do you feel well, sir? What's the name of the play? I beg your pardon? The play, the one that you're going to see at Ford's Theater. What's the name of it? Why, it's called Our American Cousin. Oh, and it's April 14th, isn't it? April 14th, 1865. Our American Cousin. And Lincoln's going to be there. Indeed he is. Get out of my way. Really, sir? I'd call your actions most strange. Where are you going? I have to stop it. Is this Ford's Theater? It is. And who might you be? It doesn't matter. You have to let me in. Are you the new understudy? No, I, I need to get a message to... Now, now, you just give me your message and I'll pass it along. You don't understand. This is a matter of life and death. I'm sure it is, but only the cast can get through this door. I'm sorry, I misspoke, you see. I am the new understudy. 
Name? Peter Corrigan, but you won't find it on the list. I'm a last-minute replacement. Sure, sure. Now, why don't you just tell me your message, and I'll see to it. Then. Let me in before it's too late. You stay back. I'll have to get through. President Lincoln is going to be shot tonight. Oh, President Lincoln, is it? Be gone with you now before I call the police. You've got to warn him. Tell everybody or the president is going to die. You shut your lying mouth about the president. It's going to happen unless you tell the guards. There. That'll hold you. Now somebody call the police and get this lunatic out of here. Next. This one was drunk and vagrant, sir. Ah, uh, you again. Hello, my boy. Uh, he Hello, Sergeant. A pleasant evening to you. Whereabouts? Right outside the Capitol, sir. Plain as you like. Ready to camp out, it looked like. Ah, uh, true, Mr. Malloy. Oh, just... just for a few hours it was. Such a nice big lawn they have. I'm sure Mrs. Lincoln wouldn't mind none. That's the First Lady to you. Let him sleep it off. I can smell it on his breath. Oh, you needn't trouble yourself. I... I can sleep out just fine on a spring night like this. The moon and the stars. If certain people would mind their own business. Come along. Next. This one, sir. Ah, a fancy Dan with too much money in his pocket, huh? What's he done? Nothing except trying to save the country from grief. You best hold your tongue. I demand you let me out of here right now. The sergeant told you to... Oh, you two idiots are arguing. You're gonna lose a president. Ah, he's got a mouth on him, doesn't he? That's what he's been yelling all the way over to the station. And that's what the doorman at Ford's Theater popped him on the head for. Tried to pound his way right through the stage door, yelling some kind of crazy things about President Lincoln going to get shot. He will be shot tonight in the theater. A man named Booth. And how would you be knowing this? Never mind. I'm telling you the truth. Now, will you stop wasting time and do something about it? I suppose you've been to one of them seances, some kind of seer or wizard or something with all the fashion these days. Stuff and nonsense, if you ask me. I only know what I know. If I told you how I know, you wouldn't believe me. So, you don't want to answer the question. Look, keep me here if you like. Lock me up, but do something. Good idea. Turnkey, let this one sleep it off, too. Come along. This way. You boobs had better hear me out! Somebody get to the president's box the fourth theater! Either keep him out of there, or put a cordon of men around him! A man named John Wilkes Booth is going to assassinate him tonight! Evening, sir. Can I help you? My card. The name is Wellington, Sergeant. Jonathan Wellington. Well, what can I do for you, Mr. Wellington? That man you just had incarcerated, Mr. Corrigan, I believe he said his name was? Drunk, sir. Well, that's probably what he is. Drunk or perhaps ill. I wonder if he could be remanded in my custody. He might well be a war veteran. If so, I'd hate to see him placed in jail. Well, that's real decent of you, Mr. Wellington. The least I could do for one of our own. A survivor of the Great Conflagration. Uh, you say you want him remanded in your custody? Precisely. I'll be fully responsible. Fully? I think perhaps I might be able to help him. I myself am a veteran, you see. I know the torment that lives on in a man's soul after returning to civilian life. It is a horror, not easily laid to rest. All right, sir. If that's what you like. But I'd be careful of this one if I was you. There's a mighty bunch of crackpots running the streets these days, and many of them his like. Many of them dangerous, too, sir. I must accept that risk. Turnkey, have Corrigan brought back out here. This gentleman's going to look after him. It's real decent of you, sir. Real decent indeed. I'll be outside. Have him brought out to me, if you would. I will indeed, sir. Next. Uh, begging your pardon, Sergeant. What is it? Uh, about that Corrigan, sir. What about him? Well, wouldn't it be wise, sir, if... If what? Well, he seems so positive, sir. So sure. Ab about the president, I mean. What would you have us do? Send all available police to the Ford Theater. And on what authority? On the word of some demented fool who probably left his mind someplace back in Gettysburg. I only thought... If I was you, mister, I'd be considerably more thoughtful at sizing up situations. You'll not advance one half grade the next 20 years. 
Now be good enough to stand aside and let me get on with my work. Sergeant, it wouldn't hurt It if... wouldn't hurt if what? I was going to suggest, sir, that if perhaps we placed an extra guard in the box with the president... The president has all the guards he needs. He's got the whole federal army at his disposal, and if they're satisfied with the arrangements for his protection, then I am too, and so should you be. Next... Take this glass of wine. It'll help you relax. Thank you. Feel better? One question. Yes? Who are you? At the moment, I'm your benefactor, and apparently your only friend. Turkish cigarette? I don't smoke. Why did you take me out of the police station? I'm in the government service. But as a young man in college, I dabbled in medicine of a sort. Medicine? Medicine of the mind. A psychiatrist. What? Well, what were they called before that? An alienist. I don't know either term. But your symptoms do interest me. What symptoms? The story you were telling about the president being assassinated. What time is it? A quarter to eight. The play won't start for another 45 minutes. This time? Precious little. What gave you the idea that the president would be assassinated? I happen to know, that's all. You have a premonition? I have a lot more than a premonition. Lincoln will be assassinated, and the course of history will be changed. Unless somebody tries to prevent it. I agree that such an event would change history. And very dramatically. As would an event that does not happen. That, too, can change the world. Then do something. Very well. I shall try to prevent it, if you can convince me that you're neither drunk nor insane. If I told you what I was, you'd be convinced I am insane. So all I'm going to tell you is that I happen to know, for a fact, that a man named John Wilkes Booth will shoot President Lincoln with a pistol in Ford's theater. I don't know what time it's going to happen. That's something I forgot, but... Something you forgot? Listen. Please. What's the matter? I think I better sit down. Take my handkerchief. That bruise on your head hasn't been treated properly. You'd best cover it. That's... That's odd. What is? I'm so... Uh, I'm so faint all of a sudden. So weak. I... It's almost as if I were... As if you were what? As if I'd s suddenly got drunk right. Or something else. I've... I've never... Never felt like this before. I'm so... Yes? The wine! You devil. You drugged me. You drugged me, didn't you? You drugged me. <sighs> I was forced to, my young friend. You're a very sick man, and a sick man doesn't belong in jail. He belongs in a comfortable accommodation where he can sleep and rest and regain his... his composure, his... rationale. Rest, Mr. Corrigan. I'll be back soon. Please. Please, you've got to believe me. Lincoln's going to be shot tonight. And that's extremely odd, because... Perhaps I'm beginning to believe you. Good night, Mr. Corrigan. Rest well. No! No! Please. Please. Let me out of this room. It's true. All of it. I know that the President of the United States is going to be assassinated tonight. Stand aside. There's no need to break it down, officer. I have an extra key. Oh, good Lord! Are you all right, sir? What's happened here? What time is it? You've got to tell me the time. It's 10.35. Come on, Corrigan. Tell me what you know. You may be a madman or a drunk. I'm neither. But you convinced me. 
I've been everywhere from the mayor's office to the police commissioner's home, trying to get a special guard for the president. And do they agree? Not one. Then go yourself. But I don't have the authority. Find out where he's sitting and get right up alongside him. That's the way it happened, shot from behind. And then the assassin jumps from the box to the stage, and he runs out of the wings. You're telling me this as if... As if it has already happened. It has happened. It happened a hundred years ago, and I've come back here to see that it doesn't happen this time. Where's the man who brought me here? Where's Wellington? Wellington? There's no one here by that name. You're mistaken. Well, I'm the chambermaid, and if he lived here, I'd know about it. Don't tell me there's no one here by that name. He brought me in here. He lives in this room. Look, this is the handkerchief he gave me. Let me see that. No, Wellington. I'm positive. I tell you, his name was... See for yourself. The initials on the handkerchief. JWB. That's right. Mr. John Wilkes Booth lives in this room, and that's who brought you here. Booth? He said his name was Wellington. That's why he drugged me. Drug, sir? He gave me wine and drugged me. He, he didn't want me to stop him. He's the one who's going to do it. Surely not, sir. Not Mr. Booth. Listen, officer. You've got to get to that theater. You've got to stop him. John Wilkes Booth. He's going to kill Lincoln. Will you leave here at once and stop him? Will you, please? Wait, what's that outside? The president's been shot. President Lincoln's been assassinated. Lincoln is dying. Oh, saints, preserve us. Oh, dear God. You were right. You did know. Oh, my dear God. I tried to tell you. I tried to warn you. And one more supporting thing I've ever tried to do in my life. God, I failed. I failed. Why didn't anybody listen? Why? Why didn't anyone listen to me? Good evening, Mr. Corrigan. Did you forget something, sir? What? Forget something? You just left a moment ago, sir. I thought you forgot something. A moment ago? Yes, sir. Where's William? William, sir? There's no attendant named William here. And this is the, the Potomac Club? <laughs> of course it is, sir. The oldest club in Washington, as you well know. I want to go back to the card room. By all means. Well, invest in new technology all you like, but I stand by a traditional portfolio. Nonsense. The digital revolution has rendered the old methods obsolete. As am I, gentlemen, and yet I keep on ticking. Diversifying is the key. Muni bonds, long-term certificates, real estate holdings. Ah, back so soon, Pete. Couldn't stay away. Come on over and join this bull session. It has to do with the best ways of amassing a fortune. What are your tried and true methods? We were talking about time travel, about going back in time. Oh, that's old hat. We're on a new tack now. Money and the best ways to acquire it. Listen, listen, all of you. I want to tell you something. Of course, old man. Are you all right? Yeah, uh, I'm all right. Then sit down and listen to a lot of palaver from some self-made swindlers. Who's the fourth man? Why, I think you know him. You most certainly do. Turn around so Corrigan here can see you. Hello, Peter. William? Is that you? William here has the best method of all. Oh, yes. Yeah. My method for achieving security is by far the best, with an absolute minimum of risk. Not at all, in fact. You simply inherit it. It comes to you in a beribboned box. William, those clothes, you, you look like... Yes? A rich man. You are a, a very rich man. Well, that's because I am, of course. But how? I was telling the boys, Corrigan, my great-great-great-grandfather was on the police force here in Washington on the night of Lincoln's assassination. He went all over town trying to warn people that something dire might happen. He was a patrolman? A lowly officer of the law. Yes, of course, and he, he looked a bit like you. Well, there is one surviving photograph. A slight resemblance, perhaps. In any event, exactly how he figured out that the president would be shot, nobody seems to know. The explanation, if there is one, is certainly not a matter of record. But because there was so much surrounding publicity, people never forgot him. He became a police chief, then a councilman, 
did some wheeling and dealing in land and became a millionaire. And after that, well, the family fortune only grew. Now then, uh, what do you say we get back to our bridge, gentlemen? Corrigan was going to tell us something. Well, what was it you wanted to say? William, you don't work here as an attendant? <laughs> Fancy that. <laughs> Not ever. And, and didn't you spill coffee on me? Spill it? Where? On my jacket. Here. But there's no spot on your jacket. You're right, there's not. Listen, old chum, I was a member of this club while you were still going to prep school. I'm certainly not a snob, but, well, sir, an attendant? <laughs> I really must protest. <laughs> Your cards, gentlemen. In the matter of time travel... Not a very fruitful subject. I just wanted to say that I've made a discovery. Some things can be changed, and others can't. The most important ones, the ones that alter the world too profoundly. It must be that such matters are in hands greater than ours. Because otherwise the present couldn't exist. Not in any form that we might recognize or even be a part of. Just as you say, Pete. I bid one spade. Excuse me, gentlemen. I must get back. Back home. Of course. Till next time. Take care, boy. I bid... Uh... Two hearts. Strange mood he's in tonight. Looks peaked, doesn't he? Mm, a bit. I wonder what's the matter with him. Gentlemen, I'm sure it has nothing to do with us. Now, let's get down to business. The vid. Good night, Mr. Corrigan. Wait. Yes, sir? How long have you worked here? At the Potomac. It's been 17 years now. And when I left the first time a few minutes ago, you remember that? Certainly. You were the attendant who saw me out? Why, yes, sir. I see. Will there be anything else? I guess not. Well, good night, then. Do you care, mister? What? Oh, uh, no, no, no. I, I'm afraid I'll have to find my own way home tonight. Whatever you say, Mac. Mr. Peter Corrigan, lately returned from a place known only as Back There, a journey into time with highly questionable results, proving on the one hand that the threads of history are woven tightly and that the skein of events cannot be undone. And on the other hand, that there may be small fragments of the tapestry that can be altered, however unpredictable the final result. Our thesis to be taken as you will in the Twilight Zone. Hi, this is Carl Amari, producer of the Twilight Zone radio dramas. I'd like to take a moment to tell you about our official website at twilightzoneradio.com where you'll get the latest news and information on these Twilight Zone radio dramas. Plus, at TwilightZoneRadio.com, you can digitally download three free episodes or any of our episodes for only $1.95 each. In this age of ever-changing technology, we've decided to make these episodes instantly available to you by making the Twilight Zone radio dramas a digital download-only series. This means that this series will no longer be offered on CD. The CD collections at our website are now being offered, while supplies last, at buy one, get one free. So be sure to get your favorites before they're sold out. Be sure to visit us often, and I'll see you in the zone. Back There, starring Jim Caviezel, with Stacey Keach as your narrator, was adapted for radio by Dennis Etcherson and based on a script by Rod Serling. Heard in the cast were David Darlow, Rich Kamenick, Roderick Peoples, Doug James, Peter DeFaria, Peggy Roeder, Turk Muller, Maria Stevens, Tony Castile, Roger Wolski, Christian Stolte, Carl Amari, and Natalia Reed. To learn more about the Twilight Zone radio dramas and to obtain audio cassettes and CDs of these programs, visit our website at twilightzoneradio.com. This copyrighted radio series is produced and directed by Carl Amari and Roger Wolski for Falcon Picture Group. Doug James speaking. <laughs>